Okay, I appreciate that, everybody. Um, so my name's Luke Hines, and uh, we're going to be doing a talk on a, a new project called Keyline. Okay, so I'll go into the, the, ins, and, the ins and outs of what Keyline is and, uh, and what it covers. So a quick intro. Uh, so I'm, I'm a security engineer. Uh, I work at Red Hat in the Office of Technology, and i um, been around security for a good number of years now. Uh, mainly tooling and vulnerability management and research. So I recently joined the Product Security Committee for Kubernetes, but I've done stuff in OpenStack and Open Daylight and various open source security committees. Um, I live in Wiltshire in the UK. It's a, it's a rural area. It's mainly software developers and farmers. That's about as much as you get there. And, um, and I'm, a, I'm a keen runner as well, so if anybody wants to talk running, I could probably talk about that all night, so, yeah. Okay, so, so let's, let's define the problem. What is it that we're actually looking at here? Because without a problem, you can't really have a solution, can you? So essentially, we're talking about remote IoT trust, okay? Now, the, the, the key take from here is, is the remote part. So with IoT, consider that devices are often in physically uh, easily accessible places. So they, you know, they can be tampered with. They're not within a, a, a secure place like a data center or an office. A lot of the time, we might be talking about units that are up in the, in the roof or outside or, and situated in areas where it's very difficult to maintain a level of physical security, and from that physical security, the actual software security itself, because people can access that device. So if we consider the security, I'm gonna see if I can turn this around, because I can't see, the, uh, can't see my own slides. Okay, so first of all, we have physical protections. So if we have a unit, it's not very, um, economical to have a human watch over it all the time. So, you know, security guards, CCTV, all of these things are not going to work. Uh, there is various types of tamper prevention that you can use. So adhes adhesives can be used to seal the box. Uh, you get special security bits, torques. These are like uh, screwdrivers. Typically, you're, I don't know what they're you know, whether this uh, is a universal term, but we have a Phillips and a flathead, and, and they have these sort of torques where there's these variations of, of screw heads. Again, really, they're not really gonna provide any decent level of security. And then you have tamper monitoring, which is effectively where there's trip switches. So if you open a device, it will trigger off an alert. Now, the problem with physical protection schemes is it's a game of cat and mouse. Eventually, somebody's going to get hold of it. There's going to be a design flaw that's not originally anticipated, and somebody's going to be able to open the unit and bypass the security protections that you have. And if we look at safe breaking, the history of safe breaking, uh, you know, it's just a continuous cycle of more security, and then somebody circumvents that security. Then we also have software security. So we have... Um, uh, mandatory access control, discretionary. So we have our, our standard permissions, uh, SE Linux or AppArmor labels. And um, we have, can have cryptographic assurity. So we can sign objects. Uh, we can look at the hash and then compare it and then make a decision that somebody's not tampered with that particular hash to suggest a trust date. And then there's um, obviously like integrity verification systems, tripwire and aid. And there's many. I mean, we could go on all day about the various sort of software security solutions that there are. But again, the problem is uh, the software trust is, it resides either in the memory or in the disk. So if there's a private key that will be resident in the memory or it'll be in a disk. And, and, and so that can be accessed, it can be tampered, it can be spoofed and so forth. And then the other aspect is you, you're at the mercy of the the lower levels of the stack. So what do I mean by that? If we take, for example, that we're talking about a remote device here, essentially you have a chain of trust from the firmware, the bootloader, or the shim, you're in it RAMFS, your kernel, 
your modules, your user land, and your runtime. So again, if we think about, we've got a device that we've remotely instantiated and provisioned. You can really only see the latter stages of that instantiation. So you can, you know, you can log in with a shell session, you can move around, you can change accounts, but you can't really get an implicit level of trust in the, level, the lower levels of the stack itself. You have to kind of make a, a loose level of trust in that. So this brings us on to a hardware root of trust, aka trusted platform modules. Now, I'm not really going to go into the deep ins and outs of TPMs. There's probably a few people here that may well know them even better than I do. Um, so we're just going to do a 101 just to bring those up to speed that are, are new to the technology. So it's a, it's a specialized chip. It's not a crypto accelerator. It's just a, it has a very simple engine that can perform certain operations such as signing and hashing and so forth. It has a, an RSA key pair uh, that it's, it's inaccessible to software. It's only a particular bus that can connect to uh, perform requests for various operations. Uh, there's, there's actually multiple keys. There's an intensity key. There's a attestation key. And you can create your own keys from that. But essentially, the, the, the key part to consider here is that the private counterpart is siloed and is within that chip, and it can't be accessed. The TPM is able to hash critical sections of firmware and software. So by hash, we're talking effectively just creating a cryptographic hash okay, to show the state of that particular object. But the extra part that a TPM can do is it can make those hashes public, and it will sign them with the private key, which, remember, is physically inaccessible within the TPM chip itself. So using the public key, you can verify that the hash list has been signed by a TPM and it's not been tampered with. Because obviously, if it's been tampered, then it would break the cryptography. So that's effectively something that we call an event log. And with this event log being made public, you can then do something called remote attestation. So you can remotely, outside of the device, Look at the hash measurements, be sure that a TPM actually signed that hash list, and then verify the integrity of the system remotely. So some of the usages for a TPM, it's quite commonly used for uh, disk encryption. So if a device was removed, from, for example, from a laptop, the TPM would no longer be, able to be present, so you wouldn't be able to get the data from the drive. It's also used for um, password key protection, machine identification. It's been used in gaming to stop people cheating. And then, as said earlier, platform integrity, which is what we're interested in here. That's a particular use of the TPM that we're using in Keylime. OK, so, so what is Keylime? So Keylime is a project that provides open source remote attestation. It was um, originally devised in MIT Lincoln Labs. In their, they have a security team there. They came up with the white paper, the cryptographic uh, relations that were used, and they put together some early code as a proof of concept. And since then, it's become an open source project, which uh, various different people are working on. So Keyline provides a measured boot. So Again, the TPM will measure various artifacts, such as the firmware, the bootloader, uh, your init RAMFS, your kernel, your modules. And then that list of hashes is made public. And then you can verify that nobody has tampered with any of those particular objects. Now, there's a bit more to it than that. There's a, an extend operation. It's a one-way hash. So hashes are concatenated together, and then they're rehashed. And this provides a level of um, assurity, because it's very difficult to go back on a one-way function. Uh, it also provides remote runtime attestation. So in the kernel, there's integrity measurement architecture. Okay? And it's been something in the kernel since, I think, Linux 2.6, kernel 2.6. 
And IMA is effectively it's a subsystem where whenever a certain action occurs and a system call happens, so I have here BPRM, MMAP, uh, SE Linux labels are changed, uh, files are executed, there's various policies that you can set up. And what will happen is when that occurs, uh, the hash will be captured, it will be put into a, a security FS, and then the TPM will perform uh, an extend on that hash, so it will build up that cryptographic hash tree again. <clears throat> and uh, what, one of the things we do with Keylime is we can continuously monitor that list as it's populated and compare it to a white list of values that we consider good. So we have like a golden state that we want the system to be in. And we can then tell if somebody has remotely executed something that we don't have whitelisted, or they've changed something, or they've changed an SE Linux label, then we can know within a matter of seconds that, that's, that the machine's been compromised and then start to take an action. Uh, we also can do encrypted payloads. So what we do here is effectively we monitor the machine. So we can monitor the boot, monitor the runtime with IMA, and then if the cryptographic state of that machine is as we expect it to be, then we can unload an encrypted payload on that machine. So that could be effectively, that could be some certificates, some secrets, perhaps a config file that has database, password strings, any sort of sensitive data. <clears throat> and we also have a, a revocation framework. So when a node fails a state, there's a series of actions that you can take afterwards. And uh, I'll, I'll go into those a bit more. We've got some more details on those. So this is the the uh, architecture. So the way to consider this is that over to, the, to your right, we effectively have the remote domain. So this is where our IoT device is. And then over to your left, we have on-premise. So these would be systems that you have within your local control, perhaps within your, your, your home network. First of all, we had the verifier. So the verifier continuously monitors the integrity state of the agent, which runs on the actual node that we wish to monitor. This is where all of the cryptographic verification happens for the boot and runtime and so forth. And um, for anybody interested in TPMs, this continuously polls a TPM quote, which is where <clears throat> Effectively, we request a quote from the TPM on the current cryptographic state of the machine. Uh, we have a register where we keep the public keys that the TPM manufacturers provide that can be used to attest the uh, signatures that we get back. And we also register the agent there. We have a, a simple database. And then we have a revocation service, which is the framework where we can kick off specific events that occur should a node fail its integrity state. And then we can also interface with a certificate authority. So for example, CFSSL. So again, if a machine fails its state, then we could revoke a certificate, which in turn would perhaps strip down all the TLS or IPsec connections. And last of all, quite interesting, some of you may have noticed in the middle it says HTTP. That's intentionally put there because we don't have any secrets at all that pass across this connection. So this can actually be open because it's effectively all that comes back is a TPM quote with a nonce. And if somebody tried to tamper with that, it would break the cryptography and the node would be seen as failed. So we have no reason to protect that connection at all. Okay, so it can be deployed in many different architectural models. So uh, a single site to a single node or device, a single site to many, many, many different devices or nodes, uh, a multi-site, multi-node, so you could connect multiple data centers together and then have a whole uh, many, many relationship of, of nodes. It works very well within multi-tenant, within a cloud scenario where I would be a cloud consumer, I would have a workload that has a, a sensitive angle to it and I can 
effectively ask a cloud provider, can I trust your hardware? So I can remotely test their hardware. If I can trust it, then I can schedule my load to execute on that, that particular hypervisor. <clears throat> and multiple can attest a single node. So you could effectively have a, like a, a user, a tester machine, and then the provider of that machine attest the machine as well. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the use cases. So the first one is where we actually bootstrap the machine and then we tag on, it's not mandatory, but we're gonna tag on an encrypted payload. Okay, so again, we have our, at the bottom we've got our machine that we're monitoring and this is running the Keylime agent, okay? And this has a TPM chip. And then at the top we have the verifier which performs the, cryptograph the, excuse me, the cryptographic verification. And then we have the register where we register the node and we keep the public TPM keys. And then over to the far right here, we have our user. And uh, they're going to use something called the Keyline Talent, which is effectively just a CLI application that we provide. But there's REST APIs for all of this as well. So you could develop your own system to integrate with Keyline. And what's going to happen is using this Keyline Talent, the, uh, the user is going to create a key just check why my keys aren't showing up. Okay, I don't know why. I've brought it out of full screen mode because my keys disappeared. I've got my keys back. Right, so effectively what's going to happen is we're going to create a key. Okay, and this is called the bootstrap key. And this is going to be cryptographically split into two pieces. Now, we're going to call these V and U. First of all, we're going to delegate to the verifier that we want to monitor the integrity of a machine. So we're going to send them the V counterpart of the key that's been split into two. Then we're going to send the U half to the device itself, which is running the Keylime agent. We're then going to ask the verifier to perform an integrity check. So it's going to perform a TPM quote onto the agent, which is then going to communicate to the TPM itself using the TPM2 software stack. What's going to happen is if that integrity is shown to be sound, in, in that we know that nothing has been tampered with, it cryptographically checks out, then the second part of the key is going to be provided to the agent, who can then put these together and then has the bootstrap key to be able to unencrypt the payload. Now, this payload, it could be something that we send over the wire, or it could be stored within an OS image. So it could be embedded into the image itself, whether that be an ISO, QCAL2, or whatever format you have. So the keys are recombined by the agent and then it's able to execute the payload and safely have the secrets delivered to the device. So, for example, if this device failed the verification, then our V counterpart, the key, is not going to be made available to the agent, and the agent's not going to be able to do anything with that information. So effectively, if somebody hacked the machine, they're not going to be able to get hold of your secrets. So that's uh, the first use case that we have, which is an encrypted payload. Uh, the second one is what I spoke about earlier, which is continuous remote attestation. So for this one, what we have is uh, a whitelist. Let me give you an example so you can see what I'm talking about. So this is, a, this is a whitelist. It's pretty simple. We've got a hash, and then we have the POSIX path to the file. Uh, this was generated by unarchiving an init RAMFS of, of a kind of a, a stock operating system. So as I said, we've got the hash and the file itself. Uh, 
And this is IMA, the IMA Integrity Measurement Architecture. It stores this on security FS. And again, there's a few more labels, but effectively we've got a hash, and then we have the full POSIX path to the object that's been measured. Now, what happens is every time a syscall is made, a various syscall, the IMA will update this list. So it will generate a new hash. But that hash will be created and extended by the TPM. So you have a hardware root of trust. Now, using these two, we have a point of comparison between the current state of the machine and our whiteness, the state that we expect the machine to be in. So as we can see, again, we have the keyline tenant, our CLI application, and we've got the whitelist. So what we do is we send the whitelist to the verifier. Remember, the verifier is on premise. We're not sending it out into the dangerous world where the agent resides. So we send this to the verifier. Uh, the verifier generates a nonce so that we don't have any susceptibility to replay attacks and so forth. And then it performs a TPM quote to the device. And the device will return the quote, and then the verifier will perform that cryptographic comparison, that differential between the expected state and the current state. Now, if that fails, then there's a series of actions that we can take, which we'll look at next. But just to, to, um, to refresh, we have the whitelist, which is the golden state. Uh, we have IMA, which populates a list based on the current state which is update, updated in real time every time an event occurs. And Keyline remotely attests the system state, IMA, against the golden state. And that happens continuously. We typically work at around, it's a configurable uh, interval, but our poll is, uh, I think the default is every two seconds. And one verifier can do that to thousands of devices. So it's a, it's very light traffic. We're talking it's a, it's a very small get request. And, um, <clears throat> and we, we did do some benchmarking and, and we managed to, I think we took it up to 2,000 devices against one verifier. Okay, so we'll look at the, uh, the revocation framework. So what we're talking about here is effectively where a device fails its trust state. Uh, again, we have the verifier at the top, and then at the bottom, we have the keylime agents. And the difference is this connects into a certificate authority. And then what happens when the device fails its state, the verifier will send out a revocation event to all of the other nodes that are alongside the failed node, and it will tell it to perform some local actions. We'll, we'll, we'll look at what local actions are in the next slide. And at the same time, should a node fail, remember we had that bootstrap key that we created, that could be um, part of a certificate authority. So a, a request could be made into the certificate authority to revoke the certificate. So then if you built up a, a TLS structure or some IPsec tunnels, based on that certificate authority, that node would then effectively be cut off. Okay, so let's just have a, a little bit more of a, a deep dive on what the rev, revocation framework is. So it's a, it's a custom framework, so you can effectively, you can come up with anything. I mean, the world's your oyster. If you can write some simple bash or some Python, uh, you, you script it yourself, and as I say, you know, anything that you can script can be kicked off locally on the machines. <clears throat> so a good example would be uh, a node fails, the verifier sends out a revocation event, which is signed so that you know that it's the actual verifier that's, that's generated that revocation event, and you could tell all of the local machines, apart from the failed machine, this machine has failed, knock out its entry from authorized keys. You know, that's something that would be relatively simple to script. 
Another one would be, a, um, again, a node fails and the verifier calls your certificate authority to make a certificate revocation. And again, the example that I used earlier, this would invalidate all of the TLS connections and then effectively you'd cut the node off because it's been compromised. Okay, a little bit more about the project itself. So um, we've had some, some really nice organic growth. People have found the project from various Google searches and, and they've come along, they've shown an interest and they've actually turned into people that are contributed. So we're, we're a kind of a multi-vendor uh, project. Uh, there's a couple of independent uh, developers that, that have come along and started working on the project as well. So as you can see, we've, um, this is a, a kind of like a, an auto-generation metric of a, a GitHub project's current state. So as you can see, uh, there's a, an increase in year-on-year -year commits. We've got a young but established code base developed by a large development team. The first commit was made in October 2016, which is when MIT uploaded the code to their GitHub repository. And then it says the most recent one was an hour ago. Uh, we're very welcoming and friendly to people that want to come along and get involved. You don't have to be a security expert. You don't have to even be a developer. We need people that just uh, try out the solution, tell us how to improve it, perhaps write documentations. It, you know, we're, we're very open to any help that we get. We do mark issues as good first issues, and this has attracted some people to the project, and we have a contributions guide which will tell you exactly how to make a pull request, what sort of issues we need help with. And we are, we're a friendly community. I, I like to think we're a welcoming community. Uh, since the project was uh, opened by MIT, we've worked on trying to have as much continuous integration automation testing as we can. So every time somebody makes a patch, uh, we instantiate a container which runs a TPM emulator and then all of those scenarios that I've just outlined where a, uh, a machine is tested and uh, we fail and, and so forth, we, we carry out functional equivalents of those tests within a container. If the test fails, then Travis will tell the pull request that it's failed and they'll need, you know, the developer would need to fix it, make a git, a git commit, amend, send up the patch again and we'll retest it. <clears throat> Uh, we also are in the midst of um, doing the same with all of our upstream dependencies. So we use the TPM2 software stack. There's a, a software stack, a set of tools, and a resource manager that they develop. And they have various versions, and of course their master branch. So we're going to start testing against that so that we can capture any breakages as they happen. Uh, we have all our documentation that's uh, auto-generated by Sphinx and is rendered on to read the docs. And uh, we're gonna also set up build testing. So as far as coverage at the moment, uh, we're working on uh, a lot of the standard Linux distributions, so Fedora, Ubuntu, Debian, uh, Raspberry Pi uh, Buster release has been recently been verified. And, uh, and we're also open to working with as many distributions that we can. So, if somebody came forward and they wanted to get it working on X, uh, we as a community would support them. We'd, you know, we'd discuss things over an issue, we'll troubleshoot it with you and so forth. So, we currently have weekly meetings. Uh, every meeting, the agenda is a GitHub issue. That way we can easily link into issues and pull requests and do a you know, an at assigned to a particular person and so forth. And that helps us easily track everything. And we also meet once a week, Wednesday, 1500 UTC. We have a Gitter channel where we meet and we discuss the various items that we need to go through. And this Gitter channel is also, um, it's there 24 seven. So if somebody was uh, trying to achieve something with the system or something didn't work, you'll be able to jump in there Quite a few of the core developers hang out on that channel and you'll be able to get support. So that's the other key thing that we wanted for this project really was that um, uh, when new people come along, they try to get it to work, 
uh, you know, something blows up, they get an exception, you know, they have support, people that will rally around and help them to get that to work. So what's coming next? <clears throat> uh, at the moment, we're working on VTPM support. So a VTPM is a, a virtual TPM. So effectively, a virtual TPM could be uh, rendered within a virtual machine or a container. Now, the key thing with a virtual TPM, you don't have that hardware root of trust. So effectively, the keys for the VTPM are stored within the disk. But VTPM, VTPMs are very useful because you can create them at scale, and every container or virtual machine can run its own local TPM. So one of the things we've been looking at doing is, is extending that hardware trust from the hardware TPM into the virtual TPM. So at the moment, we're working on this with Boston University and one of the professors from MIT that originally worked on the project. And we're effectively going to um, pull all of the quotes together, build them into a Merkle tree, and then have one central hardware request, quote request to the TPM, which will then effectively allow us to uh, pull a quote of thousands and thousands of devices into a single operation. Because one of the things with hardware TPMs, uh, they're not designed for handling multiple requests. They typically expect to just work with one, well, one piece of metal machine themselves. Uh, so this would allow us to have mass scale and it extends the cryptographic trust from the hardware TPM to the VTPM. The other thing we're working on at the moment is um, Keylime is developed in Python, and uh, we're porting the agent to Rust. So the, the agent is the part that runs on the remote machine. So that's in a more hostile environment. And uh, we're going for Rust quite simply because it's very performant. There's no runtime garbage collection, and the security uh, Rust has a very strict compiler around memory safety and thread safety. So you tend to deal with a lot of your security technical debt when you're actually trying to get your code to compile. <clears throat> so last of all, just to round up, uh, you know, we're a, we're a young project. Uh, we're looking for people to get involved, anybody. You know, you don't have to be a security crypto expert or even a developer. Uh, architects, users, people that have got TPMs, people that are producing their own boards, anybody, we welcome you to come along and get involved. Uh, we have a website where you can get hold of everything easily, like our documentation, find out where the repositories are, uh, how to get a simple system up and running. And then, as mentioned earlier, we have a community chat channel where you can jump in 24-7 and uh, ask any questions. So talking of questions, we have a few minutes. Should anybody have anything they'd like to ask? Sure. Um, you're probably going to need a mic. Um, is this one good? One, two. Oh, yeah, here we go. Thanks for the talk. Um, the connection to the TPM is usually via I2C on the board, so that would be uh, subject to local attacks. Is there some way to authenticate that if you have a trusted boot or something on my SOC? Yeah, so the, uh, we, this part is looked after by the TPM software stack. So they have a built-in uh, session authentication system. So we're quite lucky. What we do is we effectively wrap around the command set that they provide and that allows us to put in commands to create a session. And they've got lots of things in there to prevent dictionary attacks and replay attacks and stuff like that. So, so luckily that, because we sit on top of a, uh, a quite actively developed stack that provides a resource manager, a set of tools, and a software stack itself, the TSS, that's actually all part of that system there. Does that answer your question? Cool. Um, someone else? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you for also sharing these uh, community insights. <laughs> that was very, very interesting. Well, uh, one question towards that. Uh, who's sponsoring the CI in infrastructure and who is uh, maintaining and operating the uh, pipeline? So nobody at present. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a free 
Travis. They provide a free account for open source projects, and and I tend to set it set it up myself. So <laughs> I sponsor it, but not with cash, just time. Okay. Sure. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned a few times that the TPM is doing measuring of various code at boot. Um, I'm a bit surprised because I thought the TPM is not doing DMA and controlling all the buses. So how exactly is the TPM measuring anything? Yeah. Okay, so, so um, effectively what happens is, so, so the TPM never makes a decision on the trust state. All it does is it signs the object itself. So there'll be, this is where I'm not, I'm not a TPM expert, but from what I understand, there's a core root of trust. There's a CRTM, okay, which is like a seed, okay. And then it will take the next part of the boot chain, whatever that might be, the firmware, and it'll take a hash of that, and it'll add the two hashes together, so it'll concatenate them, and then it will sign those. And then the next part will be measured, okay. And then that will continue until you have a complete one-way hash function, which will allow you to effectively replay the, the boot. Is that, is that what you, you were asking about, or something around the communication? Um, well, the, the, the problem I'm having is understanding, so essentially the TPM so, so the TPM is not, uh, not the thing on which the security depends, but rather another component which reads all the data and feeds it to the TPM. So uh, the TPM, even if the TPM is working correctly, uh, you have no guarantee that the rest of the system has not been tampered with because um, the rest is reading the data, right? So there's, there's, there's two, with, within the context of Keyline, there's two parts that feed the TPM. So one of them is IMA, which is part of the Linux subsystem, okay? I wouldn't really be able to tell you about the attack vectors in there, but it's, it's been around for about, oh, I think, close to nine, ten years, that code now, so it's pretty well audited. And uh, that, that came out in kernel 2.6, I think. So that's IMA, which measures the runtime, okay? And what will happen is IMA, if it senses a TPM, then it will send its measurements into the TPM, into a platform configuration register, which is a, a particular part of the TPM where a hash is stored, okay? Now, if it's the boot, then there is in fact a shim, which can do the same thing. It can, if a TPM is present, then the shim will extend its measurements into the TPM itself. Around the protections on that, I, I wouldn't be able to comment, I'm relying on the kind of the maintainers and, and the people that are developing that. So we're more of an application that's sitting on top of that software stack. But it's very widely audited, I believe, and, and so I'd, I'd be fairly confident in the, the security of that. No exploits have been reported since TPM 1.2, which was depreciated quite a long time ago. And I think that's a case of somebody was I think they had an oscilloscope and a soldering iron and, you know, it was that, that sort of attack. Okay, no worries. Uh, anybody else have a question? Uh, okay, yeah, sure. So you have, you have been talking about uh, having a certificate for the key in the TPM. On many embedded systems you also have uh, certificates and keys for things like VPN tunnels or something like that. Is uh, managing and renewing certificates of that kind also in scope for Keylime or is that something that another component would do? So that would be managed by a certificate authority. Okay, so Keylime. Not something that we do at present. Um, all we would be able to do is we could effectively tie the certificate into a CA in the aspect that if the machine is compromised, you can revoke and invalidate that certificate. You could do an encrypted payload, which would have your, your SSH keys, your TLS certificates, and so forth. So if the trust state of the machine is good, 
then a key will, the second part of the key will be released, which will allow the device to unlock its secrets. So you could do a follow-up provision, that's quite possible, where you could restage some more secrets, but again, you'd ensure a non-compromised state on the machine first. And you could tie that into a CA as well. Yep. Okay, uh, anybody else? Cool, okay, so thanks everybody for your help. Sorry about me having to keep Ben round. I couldn't see the slides on my laptop, so that's why I had to keep craning my head round. But um, I'm here all week, so do come and grab me if anybody wants to you know, learn some more details or find out a bit more about the project. I'm here all week as well. I'm also here for the, the Linux Security Summit, where I'm hopefully gonna do a demo of Keyline. We'll do a live demo if we can. So thank you. <laughs>